Well, and notice there the, that God is talking about the consuming their flesh, consuming their eyes, consuming their tongue. What do you got? One, two, three. What is that? What is the overriding picture then of the verse? This is the purpose of God. This is God's will. This is what God has ordained. This is what is going to happen. There will be no question that this is going to happen. Well, then verse 13 backs up just a little bit, just a little bit. And it shall come to pass in that day, still talking about judgment day, a great tumult from the Lord shall be among them, and they shall lay hold every one on the hand of his neighbor, and his hand shall rise up against the hand of his neighbor. Now, what could that be talking about? Uh, it's, it, it sounds like the unsaved will be fighting with one another and destroying one another. Now, it's very interesting that when we study the Bible and God is giving us pictures of the wrath of God or historical parables, we have at least a couple of very dramatic accounts where this very thing did happen. For example, if we go back to Judges chapter 7, Judges chapter 7, that's earlier on in the Old Testament, and we find there that Gideon is fighting with the Midianites. And the Midianites are, are, are all around Israel, and uh, tremendously all around. And here comes Gideon, who has been named of the Lord to fight with, uh, to fight with uh, uh, the Midianites. And God has winnowed him down to 300 men, and all they have is a, a, a trumpet and a pitcher uh, in their hand, and that's it. They don't have a sword in their hand. And now they're going to fight with the, the, with the tremendous numbers of the Midian hosts. And uh, uh, we find in, in uh, verse 22 of Judges 7 what happened. Judges 22, or Judges 7, verse 22. And the 300 blew the trumpets, and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the host. And all the host fled to Beshida in Zerahath, and to the border of Abel Mahola, unto Tabath, and, and so on. And eventually uh, the Midianites were all destroyed. Okay, now notice the language. The Lord set every man's sword. Look at the parallelism there to what we read in Zechariah 14. And it shall come to pass in that day that a great tumult from the Lord shall be among them. In other words, it is God's plan to bring self-destruction upon the, the dominion of Satan as it approaches the end. And he does that in a very interesting way. You know, sin is self-destructive. Has anyone ever benefited from sin? Well, momentarily you do. You steal, and so you got some money in your pocket, and you think, I made it. But the fact is that if, if we go long enough, any kind of a sin finally ends in destruction. That's the nature of sin. We're blinded by it to think that it has some value right at the moment. Uh, if we're carrying on in a in a uh, uh, an affair with with someone of the opposite sex, and and my, we think this is marvelous, 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 and it's contrary to the will of God. Uh, the fact is, it will bring destruction in our life. It always works that way, even though momentarily it may look like something I really need, or uh, and and so on with sin. Well. God multiplies sin in order that that sin will act as self-destruction. Let me give you one other illustration, first of all, of how God used a historical parable to illustrate this principle. If we go back to Second Chronicles chapter 20, uh, we find during the reign of King Jehoshaphat, who was a God-fearing king, that the, tr that the uh, nations of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, or Esau, marshaled them together against Judah, over which Jehoshaphat reigned. This in Second Chronicles 20. And, uh, and they were uh, a tremendous host. And uh, in verse 2, for example, it says, There came some and told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee 
from beyond the sea on this side Syria. Uh, and uh, Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And then we have a very lovely account of this king who put his total trust in God and says, I can't do it, God. I can't do it. What do we do? And, and, and uh, God told him, you wait. I will take care of the matter. And so we finally wrote, read in verse 20, verse 20, and this is one of these accounts that fill us with joy because we see how God is victorious, except that it has this horrible other side of the coin, and that is if we're still unsaved, we better mark ourselves with Moab and Ammon and Mount Seir. But what happens? And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. That word Tekoa means what? The blowing of the trumpet. And uh, and this is a picture of the end of the world when when uh, when the believers are waiting for the wrath of God to follow, they're waiting for ve- God's vengeance to fall, and we don't we don't uh, uh, finally get victorious over the unsaved who are who are destroying us and who are dra- driving us out of the church and silencing the gospel wherever we can they can. We don't get the victory. We don't have a God doesn't have a program for us to get even with them, but we wait for God to come. And he, Christ will come as the judge of all the earth, and this is what will happen. They arose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. In other words, it's an opening statement. Now look, you trust in the Lord. He's made some commitments here. He's made some promises. You know, sometimes we're in churches today, and uh, many are in churches where things are going bad. Uh, Almost every Sunday, there's something else that makes us uncomfortable because of what we're hearing the minister preach or some new practice that's being introduced. uh, And we may find that... uh, uh, we get a visit from one of the elders, and there's, we're told, now don't you witness concerning this doctrine that you hold now any longer in this congregation, and, and things are getting more and more difficult. And yet God promises, yes, all this is going to happen, all this is going to happen, but finally there is the day of retribution. There is the end. And then all of these will be brought into judgment. And you will have your salvation completed. You will receive your glorified spiritual body. You wait. You wait. Just wait upon the Lord. That's one of the principles of the Bible, isn't it? Wait upon the Lord. Let him work out his promises. Well, this is the emphasis here. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. I admit that at times when uh, things become very difficult, when things become very difficult, it's very hard to wait upon the Lord. We get anxious. We, uh, we fear strikes our heart. What's going to happen next? Uh, and I suppose that if the enemy physically was ready to enter our country and destroy us, we would have uh, butterflies in our stomach and or our stomach would be in a knot and we'd be pacing the floor. But... But God says, wait, wait upon me. And after all, and in fact, he even encourages us, don't fear those who can destroy the body, but fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. When we're faced with death, either through disease or through an army or through whatever it might be, if we're really a child of God, is that really a moment when we have to be apprehensive? The answer is no. No, it may be that God is bringing to pass that glorious moment when we're going to be translated into heaven to be with Christ, and nothing could be better than that. Now, of course, it may not be instant. We may suffer because of a gas attack if we were in an army or in, a, in, a, in an armed conflict, and we might die a horrible death. But is Christ sufficient even for that? We might be struck down with a very bad case of cancer and, it, uh, and we have a lot of pain for, for a few months before we die. Is God's grace sufficient for that? The answer is yes, yes. God's grace is sufficient for everything. God says that. He will not test us beyond what we're able to bear. He will provide the way of escape and that way of escape 
finally is that we trust in him implicitly. We lean back on his almighty arms no matter what happens. And so here we find put into practice this very thing with the nation of Judah. There are, there's an army out there that Jehoshaphat is absolutely convinced in the flesh there's no way that we could fight that army and win. We are in trouble, really big trouble. And God says, don't you even marshal one man. You wait, I'm going to take care of this. And so Jehoshaphat, talk about faith. I mean, just as an aside here, and maybe it's a nice, a nice counterbalance for some of the other ugly things we're saying, but talk about a marvelous faith as he says, now, now uh, you hear me, uh, O Israel, and you, you uh, listen to what God's prophets have said. And then it goes on, and when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord, and that should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and to say, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endureth forever. Can you imagine that? Can you really imagine that? Here, you're on the threshold of being destroyed. And here, Israel hasn't marshaled one man. There's not one sword in evidence. They're singing songs of praise to God. Why? Because God had made a commitment to them. I will take care of this matter. And they're trusting the Lord. Of course, spiritually speaking, it's the same fact when when uh, we lo read the Bible and we read that we're under the wrath of God because of our sins. We ought to be climbing the walls with fear. And yet God comes along and he says, look, if you've trusted in Christ, if you trust what the prophets say about Christ, and, and that comes right out of the word of God, so that Christ is your Savior, there's nothing to fear. There's nothing to fear. Your sins have been paid for. And so what should you be doing? Climbing the walls in apprehension? No, singing songs of praise. That's why we have so many praise songs. That's why when you read the Psalms, you find so many praise songs, because we're thanking God for what he has done, even though we're still living in a body of flesh that still lusts after sin, even though we're living in a world which is the shadow of death, and we see most of the peoples of the world heading straight for hell, uh, and and we see the end come charging up upon this world, uh, ready to bring judgment upon all the unsaved of the world. And in the face of all this, the true believer can be a completely quiet, completely secure, uh, knowing he dwells safely. Well, let's see what's what happened. And verse 22, And when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. For the children of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, utterly to slay and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, everyone helped to destroy another. And when Judah came toward the watchtower in the wilderness, they looked upon the multitude, and behold, they were dead bodies fallen to the earth, and none escaped. And Israel hadn't raised a finger. But now you ask the question, well, how does that apply to the end of the world? I don't see, I don't see uh, the unsafe killing e each other off. Don't you? Don't you? What death, finally, is the most terrible death that mankind can, can receive? Eternal damnation. What are the unsaved of the world doing to save each other from eternal damnation. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. On the other side of the coin, what are they doing to guarantee eternal damnation? Everything possible. They're coming with their false gospels that, uh, that are uh, so t tremendously deceptive so that people think that they've really come into the truth when they haven't come into the truth, so it's, they get locked into that path toward eternal damnation. They come in with their sin, uh, saying more and more that this is our right to do this, to be a homosexual, to, uh, to engage in sexual perversion, to practice abortion, to practice birth control. 
sin after sin is highlighted and adulated and and uh, and recommended and and everything of this nature is a sword against your neighbor because you are causing your neighbor more certainly than ever to end up under eternal damnation or to say it in another way who is the only one attempting to save these who are out there on the battlefield to really uh, really protect them and save them. The only one is the one that comes with the true gospel that says, look, you're on your way to hell. Uh, God will still have mercy if you cry out to him. And, and yet as we approach the end, there are fewer and fewer voices of this nature. And there is, are more and more voices and they're more strident and they're more, uh, they're more, uh, they're proliferating everywhere. This, with with ideas and philosophies and and practices that are driving people more certainly than ever into hell, and so we're not surprised to uh, to read this kind of uh, this kind of language over here uh, that here in uh, in uh, uh, Zechariah chapter fourteen verse thirteen as it says that they shall lay hold every one on the hand of his neighbor. And his hand shall rise up against the hand of his neighbor. It is, it is the destruction of the world by the world, as they are, are as sin is multiplying everywhere. Now we turn to ver, uh, verse fourteen of Zechariah fourteen. And Judah also shall fight at Jerusalem, and the wealth of all the heathen round about shall be gathered together, gold and silver and apparel in great abundance. Okay, how are we going to look at this? Now, who is Judah? Who is Judah? What do we read in Mark chapter 13 or in Matthew 24? When the abomination of desolation stands in the holy place, as Daniel spoke of it, then those who are in Judea, which is the land of Judah, shall flee to the mountains. Judah is the church. Ju Judah is the body where the body of believers should be found. But what is Jerusalem? Uh, in, uh, notice in verse 12, it talks about those who fought against Jerusalem. In this context, what is Jerusalem? The body, the Jerusalem in this setting consists of the true believers, those who are the city of God. Remember, we opened up in Zechariah 14 where it says in verse 2, For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. The attack of Satan near the end, of course the attack has been going on all through history, but during the final tribulation when Satan is loosed and God is bringing judgment upon the church, the attack becomes very vicious. It becomes very, very big. It becomes very overwhelming because it is God's purpose to, to bring judgment against the church. And, and yet Jerusalem is still the body of believers. And when it says Judah shall fight at Jerusalem, it means that the church will destroy itself. It will destroy itself. It will drive the true believers out who remain the residue tied in with Jerusalem in an eternal spiritual way. But the, the work of the church is not to build up the kingdom of God during the final tribulation, but to try to destroy the kingdom of God. Now, now you ask any preacher, however liberal he might be or however he may have mutilated the, the nature of the true gospel or however he has diminished the authority of the Bible, and you say to him, Sir, do you really agree with me or with the, what I read in the Bible that you are out to destroy the kingdom of God? And you'll say, What happened to you? Have you flipped? Are you, are you crazy? Why would any preacher of the gospel be out to destroy the kingdom of God? But you see, if that's what they're doing, it's, they're completely blind. 
they're totally blind and and without realizing they are serving Satan. So while in their in their own knowledge and in their own mind they think they are doing the best for the kingdom of God, in actuality they are destroying. It is Judah against Jerusalem. And uh, and uh, that again m- parallels what we read in the previous verse, that that there is uh, self-destruction. I mean, uh, the enemy destroys the enemy. And, uh, and so Judah, as it fights against Jerusalem, all in Jerusalem who are not saved, who don't belong there eternally, will be snared and taken, will be, will be conquered. They will be, uh, and even those who are saved, in, a, in one sense, to use the biblical language, will be killed as the two witnesses are killed. But 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 uh, that will not be victory for Judah. Uh, they will still be tied into Jerusalem, as we saw in Zechariah 14, verse 2, where the re- residue remains in the kingdom of God, or in Jerusalem. But now we get to the next phrase. And the wealth of all the heathen, the word heathen here is a word that is commonly translated nations or Gentiles. We normally use the word heathen in our day, to describe the barbarians of the world who know nothing at all about the gospel and and who are some kind of a third world country somewhere, like in times past when the missionaries went out to China or India or wherever, they were the heathen. But actually, the word heathen in the Bible is the word that means Gentiles, anyone who is a non-Jew, or just the nations of the world. And... and uh, uh, when it talks about the wealth of all the nations shall, uh, round about shall be gathered together. This is a universal word. It is simply talking about the whole world. Uh, the, but we wonder, what is, what's this saying? The wealth of all the heathen round, or all the nations round about shall be gathered together, gold and silver and apparel, in great abundance. What could that mean? Now, there are two phrases in the Bible, or two places in the Bible, which help us very greatly in this. Incidentally, the word wealth is a Hebrew word that is frequently translated as, as hosts, the hosts, uh, of the, uh, of the, uh, of the people, the armies of the people, and it is also translated armies very frequently. However, in this context, as well as in a number of other places, this word does not work if we translate it armies. It has to be translated wealth because it's talking about gold and silver and apparel. And you can't relate that very well to armies. So the translators have done a correct job of translating here, I believe. The wealth of all the nations round about shall be gathered together, gold and silver and apparel in great abundance. How are we to understand that? The passage that speaks directly to this is Isaiah 23. Isaiah 23, and we looked at this in an earlier study. We'll just therefore uh, go through it in a in a uh, quickie, just just uh, 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 very uh, very quickly. In Isaiah 23, it's talking about Tyre in verse 15, and it shall come to pass in that day that Tyre, which is a uh, a city that typified the nations of the world. You could substitute the, all the nations of the world. Shall be forgotten 70 years according to the days of one king. After the end of 70 years shall Tyre sing as an harlot. And in verse 17, and it shall come to pass after the end of 70 years that the Lord will visit Tyre and she shall turn to her hire and shall commit fornication with all the kingdoms of the world upon the face of the earth and her merchandise, that ties in with the gold and silver and apparel, and her merchandise and her hire shall be holiness to the Lord. It shall not be treasured nor laid up, for her merchandise shall be for them that dwell before the Lord to eat sufficiently and for durable, that is, lasting clothing. And remember when we went through this, we saw that the earth, typified by Tyre, was designed to serve God and to serve mankind in a very God-glorifying way. But Tyre went in rebellion. The earth went in rebellion against God and, 
and came under the the ownership of Satan. He became the prince of the power, or became the prince of this world, and mankind uh, thereupon uses this world for their own sinful pleasure. But the 70 years here are speaking about at the end of the final tribulation period. We won't get back into that. We had looked upon that earlier. At the end of the final tribulation period, Tyre shall return to her hire and shall commit fornication with all the kingdoms of the world. Now remember, what was her original hire? To serve God on behalf of all the people who would live here. In the, but throughout the history of the world, it has been fornicating with God and with the kingdom of God and has served the, the uh, served Satan. But now, at the end of the world, it will commit fornication against Satan and against all the kingdoms, uh, the peoples of the world who are using it for their own, for their own, uh, pleasure, it will commit fornication with them and return to the hire that God had originally established for the earth, namely to serve mankind. And that, of course, will take place in its, in its finality in the new heaven and the new earth. The earth no longer will serve Satan. It will no longer ser serve sin. It will serve God. And as it serves God, it will be like it has committed fornication with with uh, Satan, because Satan has ruled over the earth for 13,000 years. That's the sense of Isaiah 23. But that's parallel to what we are finding here. The wealth of all the nations round about shall be gathered together, gold and silver and apparel, in great abundance. Now, there's one other verse we have to introduce as we try to sum this up, and we won't have time to sum it up all together. In our next study, we will sum this up. But in the meanwhile, look at Proverbs chapter 13, verse 22. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 22, which also speaks to this particular question. There we read, uh, A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. There's the principle. Now, what is the wealth of the world? It's the, intrinsically, it's the world itself. That is the wealth. In other words, uh, this is where uh, uh, all of our wealth comes from. Our gold and silver, our jewels, our buildings, everything uh, comes out of the earth. It identifies totally with this earth. Now, the sinners claim it. This is mine, this is mine, this is mine. The unbeliever, or the believers are strangers and pilgrims here. But throughout eternity... It, the new heaven and the new earth that this world will become will no longer belong to the sinners. It will belong to the believers, and it will be as if it has been uh, held in, in, in uh, reserve or in custody until the coming of the new heaven and the new earth when the believers take possession. Well, we have to stop right there. In our next study, we'll finish talking about verse 14, and then we're going to look at verse 15 where it talks about the plague of the horse and of the mule and the camel. What could that be? Again, it sounds kind of ominous, doesn't it? We're continuing with our program, and now we have an opportunity to receive questions or comments from our studio audience. What, what is your question? Um, in verse uh, 12 that we yes. talked about, Zechariah 14, 12, where it's speaking of the flesh consuming away while they stand upon their feet and so on, you spoke of that as being like a corpse. I was immediately reminded of the fact that we are dead in trespasses and sins in our sinful nature. Yes. And there's a verse in Isaiah 59. Of course, that whole chapter describes the sinful condition of man. There's one verse that uh, is very parallel, verse 10, Isaiah 59, 10. Isaiah 59, verse 10. Uh, there we read, uh, We grope for the wall like the blind. We grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as in the night. We are in desolate places as dead men. 
As a matter of fact, that standing, you know, also indicates there's existence forevermore. The corpses aren't lying down, they're still standing. Also, to me always, I thought it talks about atomic warfare. This verse 12. Uh, well, I, we are tempted, That you see. We have to be careful. Uh, many times in the Bible we will read a verse that seems to identify with something that is currently in the, in the world. That's why repeatedly uh, they have put their focus on the wrong person as the Antichrist. In the days of the Reformation, for example, the Pope of, was definitely the Antichrist. Why so many things fit. Or it talks about seven hills, and that really identifies with Rome, uh, and, and so on. And in, there's a lot of language that seems to talk about what happens with nuclear war. Uh, and, uh, but, no, no, we got to find our answers right in the scriptures. And God is simply using the horrors of what this world can produce to, do, to give us word pictures of the exceedingly horror of, of uh, hell and damnation. Now, you see, let's test this. If we said that this has to do with nuclear war, then could all of the terrible things in Deuteronomy 28 also fit within that kind of a landscape of, of a nuclear war? And the answer is no, they would not all fit. And, and this is just another picture that God paints. And... And God really is, is, is finding the most terrible things we as humans, like for example in, in Deuteronomy 25, it talks about the mother, or Deuteronomy 28, the mother eating the, the baby that came forth from her own womb and, uh, and not wanting anyone else to see because she, she craves that meat just for herself. And well, that has nothing to do with nuclear war. Uh, but it, again, it is another horrible idea that, you know, we, we almost want to vomit when we read that kind of language. But, yeah. I have a question on verse 12, too. And this um, language is going to be an allegorical language that talk about the plague. It could be a false gospel to, um, you know, happen in the church today that make the believers blind and no will at all. Same thing, too. Could be. Well, it could carry that meaning, you know, that, that there's also uh, a... The moment, the moment we're under damnation, we're already suffering the plagues of God in a, in a spiritual sense. Of course, ultimately, it is talking about eternal damnation in hell, where we will forever be experiencing these dreadful things. Okay? And, yes? Example, I mean, the plague that you just mentioned, you know, falling prey to a false gospel. Remember where it says, I will send them a strong delusion, delusion. that they should believe a lie. Yeah. Uh, I think Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. A strong delusion to make them believe a lie. And, and a false gospel is a real plague. It's a real plague. But uh, it is not the plague that... Re you, you look, for example, at Second um, or at uh, Revelation chapter 22, verse 18 that if you add to the words of the prophecy of this book, I will add to you the plagues written herein. And God, the plagues he's written therein is really uh, ultimately Judgment Day and what follows, and, uh, eternal damnation that, that come upon them. Isn't it interesting as we're looking at these verses uh, and we find that they tie in with Judges 7, tie in with Second Chronicles 20, tie in with Proverbs 13, indicating again the, the um, cohesiveness and the unity of the Bible, indicating it is God's Word, because these other passages were written by different men hundreds of years uh, uh, earlier or later, uh, in, in these cases all earlier, uh, or if we tie it in with language of Revelation, it was much later that it was written, and yet it all comes together as one truth. Even though it may be horrible truth, or even though it may be wonderful truth, it still is God's Word. Yes? I was going to make a point. You know, you talked, like, the question came up about nuclear war, and could this be referring to that? Um, what, it, what I've also noticed is that it tends to demean or dilute the impact 
that the Bible is trying to convey, that God wants to convey through his word. For instance, they talks about the plague of locusts, and they say, oh, well, that refers to the helicopters today. You know, they'll talk yeah. about, you'll read that in, yeah. you know, in the books, the uh, late great planet Earth or something. And it takes away from any threat of an eternal yeah. damnation. It's just sort of a temporal thing. It's a man-made thing. It's a, it's a carnal thing rather than... Yeah. God's spirit. Well, and of course, mankind has desperately got to do that because he, it's unacceptable to face this ugly language. Man doesn't want to talk about hell and the reality of it. But if we don't, we're only kidding ourselves. We're absolutely kidding ourselves. If we don't look at this in the eye and talk about it fairly and squarely, and if it means that we're squirming in our seat and, and can't sleep tonight, well, so be it. It's still the day of salvation. It means we can still cry to God for mercy. But supposing we don't talk about it, and the end comes, and there we sit, unsaved. And we're actually there, and there's no, no turning away. We're going to answer for our sins. We're going to spend an eternity under this awful, awful, awful wrath of God. What would you rather have? A time of uneasiness now, and, a, and, and a, the possibility of, of still... Uh, becoming right with God or coming to that time when all hope is gone. Those are the options that man has today. Those are the only two options. And, and that's why we so fervently blow the trumpet. That's why we keep encouraging people uh, to listen, listen, and take this seriously. This is, not, this is not just conversation. This is not scare tactics. This is not something just to... Uh, to uh, frighten you a little bit, but this is absolutely serious. This applies to every human being. Either we're saved and and all is well with our soul, or we're still under damnation. And one of the two is; those are the only two options. There's one one of the two is going to come to pass in the life of every human being. Okay. Yes, Mr. Camping. <clears throat> When uh, God brought judgment against Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, it mentioned that they were standing in the door of their uh, tents when they uh, were judged. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a little different picture there. They were standing, uh, and then the earth swallowed them up, did it not? Uh, they, they and their families. And um, I don't know whether, whether the standing in that context identifies uh, certainly the judgment is is parallel or or is a is a picture of eternal damnation as this is uh, you, you mentioned about the harmony you know going from all these different books um, one of the things that jumps out to me is this uh, second chronicles uh, 20 20 verse 20 where it talked about uh, the wilderness of Tekoa yeah well there was a case where you know they they uh, were singing and they were praising the Lord and but also in effect they were standing still they played no part in their salvation it's just like they stood before the red sea parting and god right. said stand still and behold the salvation of the lord yes it's the same kind of thing we're talking about judgment day in the sense that they passed through they were safe but pharaoh and all of his hosts was swallowed up in the red sea yeah. we see this reference to in because of tekoa we see the reference uh, it links up with amos 1:1 where it talks about fleeing the days before uh, the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah, and the days before the earthquake. Uh, the earthquake representing Judgment Day. Here's Zechariah 14 talking about Judgment Day for the unsaved and then leading into the Feast of Tabernacles yeah. for the believers. Yeah. It's a beautiful... Oh, yes, there are a lot of concept. parallels. That's why it's so interesting to uh, look at a chapter we have never looked at before. I never in any Bible study have gone through Zechariah 14 before, and... And uh, it's a delight to me because uh, it, it, it identifies again with other passages. And again, you realize, well, of course, this is the word of God. God is very, very uh, uh, accurate in everything that he says. And when we finally unravel it, we find that, yeah, it started out very difficult with a, in a difficult way. And yet we can learn a whole lot from it, even though we have to admit we don't. We don't solve every problem. We still have to be very modest about it that there are nuances that we haven't seen as yet. But now we've come to the end of our time. Until our next study, may the Lord richly bless you.